Um, we left off the other day in Sonnet 18. We then learned 1 through 8. <clears throat> and so we're going to turn uh, after line 8 with the Volta. I talked about, you know, how in an, in an Italian or a Petrarchan sonnet, they're constructed of the octave and the sestet, and at the end of the octave, at the end of the first eight lines, you get a turn, a switch in emphasis. Notice how Shakespeare does that in line, um, let's go from the last couple lines of the octave and then look at the turn. And every fair from fair sometime declines, that is, every beautiful thing declines from beauty. That is, as time wears on, the beauty fades and such. But by chance or nature's by nature's changing course untrimmed. That is, chance, nature's changing course, do what? They untrim the beauty. They remove the ornamentation of beauty. But, and there's the term, but, this is page 887, um, thy eternal summer shall not fade. Why won't it fade? Because it's eternal. It's outside of time. So time can't damage the eternal summer of the person being addressed, right? But how can it be eternal? Because every summer naturally does what? It turns into fall. But thy eternal summer shall not fade nor lose possession of that fair, and we've already heard fair means beauty, of that beauty thou owest. Oast means owns, right? So, your eternal summer will stay eternal summer, and your beauty will stay beautiful. Nor shall death brag thou wanderst in his shade. When... <laughs> In eternal lines to time thou growest. So, you know, eternal, eternal, eternal. Okay? Death, death won't be able to brag. Got you. Why? Only, death only will not be able to do that. When in eternal lines to time thou growest. That is, you increase. Well, what eternal lines? Because eternal lines kind of implies what? What happens to people the older they get? Naturally. Look at a face. Gets wrinkled. So, if somebody gets wrinkled by the time they're 70, multiply 70 by 10. Imagine how wrinkled they are by the time they're 700. By 10. 7,000. By 10. So... Eternal lines, all you be is a wrinkle. How so? Look at the final couplet. Look at how he sums this up. Just brilliant. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see. Okay. So notice two conditions there. As long as people are alive, and as long as they can see, so long lives this, this what? This poem. And this, this poem, this gives life to the dead. As long as people can still read, <laughs> and assuming they're smart enough to still read Shakespeare, what? You will live in this poem. Notice what the speaker is suggesting there. And Shakespeare isn't the first one to do this. Poets have been doing it for a long time before this. I can make you what? This is the ultimate PR claim. You know, the ultimate public relations. I can make you famous for eternity. Or, it's not implied in this one, other poets do, or, I can make you infamous for eternity. Notice this poem is all about the former. It's all about 
you will live forever in this world. All right? Look at Sonnet 20. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou. Notice I didn't pause at the end of the first line. Why? It's a run-on. It's an enjambed line. The, the idea doesn't, include, doesn't conclude until we get to the comma. So we ought to read it without stopping until we get to that mark of punctuation. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou, the master mistress of my passion. A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change, as is false women's fashion. So there's one image, right? The first quatrain introduces us to one image. A woman's face and a woman's gentle heart. Femininity, or femaleness, if you want, right? And I more bright than theirs, less false in rolling, gilding the object whereupon it gazeth, a man in hue, all hues in his controlling which steals men's eyes and women's souls amazeth. So that's the end of line eight. And for a woman wert thou first created, till nature as she wrought thee fellow doting, and by addition me of thee defeated, by adding one thing to my purpose noting. The word nothing in Shakespeare's day is pronounced like this. No team, right? So let's pause there. This, by the way, is, if I remember correctly, and the problem with doing an anthology where you don't get the whole run of the poems, um, you, you can't really follow the progression. This is the first poem that the Gender of the recipient of the ideas is made clear. In, in 1 through 19, you can't necessarily tell if the person being addressed is male or female. All right? This one, it's made explicitly clear. So, a woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou. Nature, like the goddess nature made you. And then we're told, you are the master mistress of my passion. Well, what the hell does master mistress mean? Because master is masculine, mistress is feminine. And this isn't, you know, transgender or anything like that. A ton. I mean, you want to write a paper on Shakespeare, you write on master mistress and what it means. I mean, you can easily come up with five to seven Five to ten pages on that. And there's a ton of sources, if, if you're interested. Because nobody knows, nobody has, you know, said conclusively exactly what Shakespeare means. It's open to interpretation. A woman's face kind of implies mistress. But we're going to be told later on the person being addressed is male. Master. That's the ma possibly the master mistress of my passion. Or... The master, the thing that controls the mistress of my passion. So again, there's two different interpretations right there. A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change, as is false women's fashion. So you've got a heart like a woman, but it doesn't change, as does notice False women fashion. Now, <clears throat> is the speaker suggesting all women are false? Or is the speaker only suggesting false women, false women's hearts change? Not all women's hearts, false women's hearts. Right? And I'm more bright than theirs, less false in rolling, gilding the object whereupon it gazeth. Now, what the speaker is talking about here is this medieval and renaissance notion of how sight works. 
And they thought, they believed, or at the very least, it was a poetic fiction. That the way we see is our eyes emanate beams of light. And the reason we see things is because our eyes are lighting up those things. Okay? So you will have in some sonnets, and we'll see a poem by John Donne later on, where it talks about eye beams twisting. So, you know, you look in the eyes of your lover. Your eyes are shooting out beams of light. Your lover's eyes are shooting out beams of light, and the eye beams twist. It's a metaphor for sex. It's sex before sex. This, this happened before, right? So, notice, an eye more bright than theirs. Who's the theirs? Is it just women's or false women's? Less false in rolling. See, false women's eyes, what it means by rolling is they dart from one man to another man to another man to another man. Right? It was a Renaissance commonplace that women were inconstant, unfaithful. Why? They couldn't be sexually satisfied with one man. In fact, it's not just a Renaissance comment. It goes back to you know the Middle Ages. Look at the wife of Bath, obviously. So, gilding the object whereupon it gazes. That's the idea of putting the light. Because what does to gild something mean? It means to cover it in gold. Well, light is kind of golden if you think about it, right? It's the opposite of darkness. So it lights it, it makes it bright. What do we say about beauty? It is what? In the eye of the beholder. What's meant by that? It's the beholder that makes something beautiful. I mean, we've all known people. Maybe you haven't because you're about 60 years old. You'll know people in your lives, and you're going to look at a couple, and you're going to go, how in the world can she, can she fall in love with that guy? Because maybe she's dropped dead gorgeous, and he's meh, or the other way around. It's because the one looks at the other and only sees perfect beauty. Something like that. All right? So, you have an eye more bright than theirs, less false and rolling, gilding the object whereupon it gazes. What's the object that the person being addressed gazes at? It's the first time this idea is kind of introduced that the speaker kind of suggested, I'm not worthy of you. You gild me. Okay? A man in hue, and your gloss tells you, hue means appearance, right? Face. All hues in his controlling. So give me an example of a man in appearance, who would come into a room, let's say a crowded room, not this one, that everyone, every man and woman in that room would look to that man and just kind of go, wow. Name a man. Don't, don't side to each other out loud. Who did, give me an example. Chris Hemsworth? My daughters would say, yeah, and my sons would probably go, not fair. You know? Yeah. Okay? Somebody like, wherever you just, you know, just handsome and, or, you know, uh, uh, what's, um, I'm Australian. Wolverine. Les Mills. Hugh Jackman. Can not only sing, he can not only act, sing, he probably plays the violin too, you know, just not fair. Okay? So, a man in hue, all hues in his controlling, which steals men's eyes. That means men look at it and go, shh. And notice, women's souls amaze. What's the difference between 
eyes and souls. One's physical, the other's emotional or spiritual. All right? And, hmm, and for a woman wert thou first created. Interesting line. Because what is the word for me? <laughs> a woman's face with nature's own hand painted has thou. Right? That is, it, it's almost like the speaker is saying, your face looks like a woman's face. And for a woman wert thou first created. That kind of sounds like you were supposed to be a woman. All right? That's line five, six, seven, six, seven, eight. That's line nine. Go to line ten. So, for woman wert thou first created, till nature, as she wrought thee. So nature is forming this person, you know, on the on the uh, operating slash forming table, so to speak. You know, think Frankenstein. Till nature, as she wrought thee, fell a doting. What's it mean to be doting on something? Spend too much of it. Spend too much time. You just get so wrapped up in it. Right? So as nature's making you, she kind of lost track of what she was doing. And by addition, me of the defeated. Gosh tells you. By addition, i.e. of male genitalia or male genitalia. She added something that, notice what the speaker says, defeated me. So what's the speaker saying? I don't like what she added to you. To so people who want to read Shakespeare's, you know, sonnets, and there are a lot, who want to read Shakespeare's sonnets as being about a homoerotic love affair, you got to do something with this passage. Because the speaker is saying, I'm not into that. Right? And then it makes it more clear in the next two lines. So, by addition, me of the defeated, by adding one thing to my purpose, nothing. My purpose to have sex with you, okay, by adding something that defeated my purpose. How so? by making my purpose nothing or noting. How do you represent nothing? If you were to represent nothing mathematically, how do you do it? What represents nothing? A circle. A hole of lack. His purpose was the nothing. But what did nature do? Added something. Filled in the nothing. Okay? Hamlet puns on this idea in, his, in the scene of what frame? The play within the play. When he sits down next to, next to Ophelia, puts his head in her lap, and they start talking back and forth. And he's punning about oral sex and stuff, and she's like, "Oh my God, I don't believe you!" You know, and he read the read the scene. So, by adding one thing to my purpose, nothing, and then the speaker gets even more explicit. Notice, but without being explicit. But since she pricked the out for women's pleasure, and yes. The word prick did have its other meaning, its common slang meaning, in Shakespeare's day. So, okay, so since she gave you a prick for women's pleasure, to please women, mine be thy love and thy love's use, their treasure. What's thy love's use? But let me have your love. Notice, the physical, the spiritual. 
or the physical, the friendship, the platonic. Let women enjoy you sexually. Let you and I be joined up here, friendshiply, if you want. All right? Um, Twenty-nine. Twenty. We'll do this one real quickly. When in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone be weak my outcast state. So what are we told immediately? The speaker has somehow been separated from the person being addressed. The speaker is now outcast. In trouble, deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate. A troubled deaf heaven, I rail to heaven. Notice his prayers, the speaker's cries, are bootless. Doesn't mean he's not wearing shoes. means I'm getting no satisfaction from heaven. I'm getting no remedy. God's not listening or not answering. So when these things happen, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, Featured like him, so he's listening different kinds of people. I compare myself to one who is more rich in hope, that is, who has a better chance of succeeding, or I compare myself to one who is featured, who has good looks, or like this other one with friends possessed. He's got a lot of friends. Desiring this man's art, another person, this person's skill or ability, in this person's scope, their breadth of ability. But notice what the speaker is doing. Man, if only I was like A, B, C, D, E, F. With what I most enjoy, contented least. Well, what he most enjoys, what the speaker most enjoys, is the person being addressed's presence. Contented least. Why? Because he doesn't have it. Yet in these thoughts, yet, there's the term, myself almost despising. Happily, that is by chance. It just pops into my mind. I think on thee, and then my state like to the lark at break of day arising from soul and earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. That is, I'm thinking life sucks, I'm down in the dumps, and boop, the thought of you pops into my mind, and it's like a lark at the break of day bursting forth in song. And my heaven does what? My, my soul does what? It rises up to heaven. Why? Couplet. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings. Remembering it brings joy and happiness. That then I scorn to change my state with fear. I wouldn't replace where I am with that of a king. Why? Notice, thy sweet love remembered. That's in the past. I had that. You know, better to have, you know how the rest of the phrase goes? Loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Okay? Look at number 30. Similar, similar thought. In other words, something has happened. If, if we take the series, this sequence of poems, is kind of giving us a story of a love. Whether it's a physical love, spiritual love, in one sense it's irrelevant. It's about a relationship between people. If we take it as, as discussing and expanding upon that relationship, something has happened between the first several poems, 20 or so, and, you know, at the very least, beginning around 29 or so. Somehow, the speaker is now separated from the beloved. Look at number 30 now. <clears throat> this is just, just listen to this one. This, the, the cadence and the mellifluousness 
of this poem is just beautiful. You can tell Shakespeare wrote it to be heard. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail my dear times last. Then can I drown an eye unused to flow for precious friends hid in death's dateless night, and weep afresh love long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of poor bemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, our losses are restored to the sorrow's end. The sessions of sweet, silent thought. Your gloss tells you sessions means judicial sittings. Like, the court is in session. Right? So the speaker says, when to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. Every one of you has done this before. I think it's pretty safe to say. What's he describing? When you sit down, something happens. And you sit down and you think of events of the past. Louder? Reminiscing. Reminiscing about one's experiences. And notice, these are the sessions of sweet, silent but what are these reminiscences often like? Or sometimes, maybe a better way of putting it, is what do they lead to? Or maybe probably, or maybe what prompts them? You're getting a little down, getting a little depressed. Okay. And he says, I summon up remembrance. So I summon up present tense. I summon up remembrance. Of things past. Think about the old days. It's much more meaningful when you're 60 than it is when you're 20 or 22. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought. Now look at the tenses there. I sigh, right now, present tense, the lack, presently, of many a thing I sought. Back in the past. Back in the past, it wasn't sorting, it was seeking. And now, I lack the thing I sought. <laughs> that is, it's, got like, it's either like, I never achieved the thing I sought, or I sought it and lost it. And that's why there's lack. And with old woes, old the things that I sought in the past, I do what? I knew well my times, my dear times wasted. Okay? Old woes. Things from the past. What can you, you know, what did Timon and Pumba teach us all about the past? You can't change it. Period. You can learn from it, but that's it. He says, the speaker says, with old nose, I knew well. I complain now about these problems from the past. And I complain now, my dear times waste. I complain now about what? How I wasted time in the past. But notice what the speaker is doing. Now, wasting time. Then, so when, dot, 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 then, when I do this, then this is what happens. Then can I drown an eye, a very Petrarchan image, you know, the lover's tears drown the world, so to speak. Then can I drown an eye unused to flow. When I do this new bewailing of old woes, then the tears come. Unused to flow. 
Back then, I didn't tweet over those things I saw. For our precious friends, this is what he now cries about. I drown an eye for a precious friend hid in death's fateful sleep. It's like the speakers now look me back in the past thinking they've lost me. Not lost, they've gone away. They died. And weep afresh love's long since canceled love. Love's long since canceled love. Love's woe. Why is it since canceled? Where are the friends? They're dead. Now, is that why it's canceled? Or is it because the friends in the past, something happened to the friendships? And they split. And then they died. What's the most horrible thing someone can have happen? I hate you! And then that person dies that day without ever getting to say, I love you. I'm sorry. I mean, when that happens, people are crippled by that. Okay? Hmm. So he goes on. We refresh love's long since canceled love and moan the expense of many a vanished sight, the expense of loss. Weeping over lost loved ones. Then, so when, then, then, so we're building the thens now, then can I grieve at grievances for moment. I can grieve now at what? At the past grievances. Meaning, What a damn fool I was for those past grievances. And I think this is why it's love long since canceled woe. It's because there were splits back then. It wasn't just that the, the friends died suddenly. It was we parted friendship, and then they died. Okay? And it's thinking back of the grievances, the things that split the friendship. And heavily from woe to woe tell over. Tell like a bank teller. <laughs> Sitting there going, starting here, <laughs> you know, counting all those broken friendships or broken promises or problems. The sad account of four bemoaned moments. He's counting these lists of for be moaned. I've already moaned about this. I've already complained. I've already cried about this. And now he's doing it again. Which I knew pain. Knew, like I'm, I'm doing it again all over. Newly. As if not paid before. Pay and paid as if the person is paying a penalty for it. And then look at the couple. But if the while, so when, then, then, if the while, during that time, during those sweet sessions of silent thought, okay, or during the sessions of sweet silent thought, if the while I think on you, while I'm doing that, if you pop into my head, dear friend, all Losses are restored. And sorrows end. How? How can thinking on one person seemingly mend all losses? Doesn't mean it literally, right? Obviously, it does not mean it literally. Right? Probably, it's the idea that This friend is kind of the perfection and summation of all friendships. 
you know, what is the idea? Whether or not one believes in it or not is irrelevant. But what does the idea of a soulmate mean? There's one perfect, you know, how did, uh, what's her name say it in the film, Jerry Maguire? You complete me. It's that idea. You are the match to my soul. And part of what that implies is that before one reaches that, what do you have to do? You gotta find a lot of others. In other words, every before you find that soulmate, every proto mate, <laughs> proto soulmate is merely a what? It's like trying on clothes. You're trying to find the perfect fit, okay? And the idea that seems to, to me at least seems to be suggested here is when I think of you, all those other friendships. All of those other relations, all, they, they all do what? They point to you. And that's why the thoughts are, the, the sorrows are ended. Okay, go from there too. That was the third key. Uh, what can it be, 93, 94? Oh, 73. Yeah, gotta be 73. This is another one of those sonnets that, you know, is so frequently anthologized okay, because of its emphasis on the passage of time. This one, like, um, when 40 winters shall besiege thy brow. But this is a bit different. <clears throat> and it's really nice to do it this time of year. That time of year thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. Bare ruined choirs relate the sweet bird sang. Yeah, I wish they wouldn't put that for love. Anyways, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. In me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie as the deathbed, whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. So three quatrains. Each of the quatrains gives us a different image. The first image is what? They're each the end of something. First image is the end of what? end of the year. Okay. Yellow leaves or none do hang upon those boughs, trees which shake against the cold. It's fall becoming winter. The, lead, the trees are losing all their leaves. It's, it's approaching death, right? Okay. The second image. In me thou sees the twilight of such day. It's the end of the day. So, the sun has set. It's getting dark. Death's second self that seals up all in rest. Okay. Nighttime, he's saying death's second self. It's an image of death. The light has gone out. You know, Think of Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Okay. Third image is what? It's a fire. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie. How many of you have ever been to a bonfire? Spent the night after a bonfire, I mean, at a bonfire. So you have a big old fire, you camp, what's there the next morning? Embers and ashes, okay? Is it still hot? Yeah. Can you go stick your hand in those ashes? Don't. <laughs> it is still very, very hot. But what's happened to the fire? It's burned itself out. That is, it consumed itself, and what's left are the embers and ashes. That on the ashes of his youth doth lie, right? The ashes 
or what remained of the fire's youth. Consumed with that, the fire which it was nourished by, the wood. So, three images of death. Death of the year, death of the day, death of the fire. This thou perceivest. What is it that thou perceivest? That time of year thou mayst in me behold. In me thou seest the twilight of such day. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire. So, three images of death. In me, this you perceive. Sounds like what? Sounds like the speaker's on death's door. You know, has cancer or something. It's getting ready to kick the bucket. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong. Now that's, man, you see that I'm about to die and it makes your love even greater. To love that well, that that is me. And then Shakespeare introduces a weird turn of phrase, which thou must leave ere long. Your gloss tells you leave means lose. When trees are leaving, it is an actual verb, when trees leaf, Present tense, that's when the leaves come out. When they are leaving, that's when the leaves fall off. Okay? To love that well which thou must lose. It's like the closer and closer you get to death, it makes that love so much stronger. That's a great poem. That's just wonderful. Okay. Um, 93 and 94. So shall I live, supposing thou art true, like a deceived husband. So, thus shall I live. Supposing. That's another word for supposing. Thinking. Thinking. Believing. Presuming. Thou art true, like a deceived husband. What's the, like a deceived husband, tell us? Okay, notice. I'm going to live like a deceived husband, supposing thou art true. What are we being told? Immediately. You aren't true. You are faithless to me. So, Therefore, love's face may still seem love to me, though altered you. Altered. Something's different about the face. Right? But I'm still going to think it's full of love towards me. Thy looks with me, thy heart in other. In other words, you're still smiling at me, but I know I'm not in your heart. Your heart is over there. For there can live no hatred in thine eye. Therefore, in that I cannot know thy change. What's it mean? Look at your gloss. From your eye, I cannot know that your heart has changed. Well, okay. Okay. It's kind of a little simplistic. There can, there can live no hatred in thine eye. The speaker is saying, all your, love, all your eyes show is love. So when the person being addressed looks at me, all I see is love. In many looks, the false heart's history. So in other people's, in many other people's, 
looks, you can see the falseness of the heart. How so? It is writ in mood and frowns and wrinkles strange. Strange just means new, different. You're not looking at me the way you used to look at me, etc. But heaven in thy creation did decree that in thy face sweet love should ever dwell. When you were made, heaven, go back to Sonnet 20, nature said, no, only love can dwell there. Whatever thy thoughts or thy heart's workings be, thy looks should nothing thence but sweetness tell. Outwardly, faithful, loving, true. Inwardly, faithless, hateful, false. Now look at the temple. How like Eve's apple doth thy beauty grow? Why so? We're told According to the Bible, the apple was what? Pleasing to the eye. It was desired, and it would give wisdom. Okay? Those were all what? They are all false. What did it give instead? Death. <laughs> Separation from God. How like Eve's apple doth thy beauty grow? That is, your beauty gets more and more what? If, big if, big conditional, your beauty will grow more like Eve's apple if thy sweet virtue answer not thy show. Gloss, how much your beauty grows to resemble the attractiveness of the apple to Eve if your virtue does not match your appearance? That is... Your beauty will be just like that apple. Unless you show virtue. You are merely otherwise what? One big rotten temptation. <whistles> Something's happened in this relationship, right? I mean, now the speaker's like, whoa, you are false to me, right? Go back to the one sonnet about, you know, whatever language that is. Sonnet, uh, sonnet 18. I'm going to make your fame live forever. In, you know, when in time these lines do grow, etc. Notice what else can happen. If you're not true to me, well, I can make you live in infamy. Right? 94. Is, is like the companion to that sonnet. It's essentially saying the same thing with different imagery, but we won't talk about it. Uh, we got five minutes. 106. The speaker goes back to kind of being in love and praising the beauty of the beloved in such a way as to conclude, if only we had words and mouths to speak, to be able to describe your love. He said, finishing with the couple, we which now behold these present days have eyes to wonder. We can look at you and just be in awe, but lack tongues to praise. We lack the ability to even speak your praise. Okay. One sixteen. This is probably the most famous of all of Shakespeare's sonnets because it's a sonnet about love and marriage. Ostensibly, it's about marriage, right? Back in the 70s, a lot of people incorporated this sonnet into wedding ceremonies. All right? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. 
Notice what the marriage is between. True minds. What's meant by true? Straight, upright. If you have a bicycle and you take a bicycle tire and you loosen a bunch of the spokes, the tire will go like that. It'll get wobbly. So that eventually, if you loosen enough of them, the rim will come, what's called, out of true and will rub up against the forks. And you won't be able to use it. Okay? So, like, like you know, railroad tracks, the, the rails have got to stay true to each other. Right? Let me not to the marriage of true minds. These are minds that are parallel to each other. Okay? Admit impediments. This is kind of a rephrasing or an echo of the bands that I was talking about the other day. If there is anyone who knows good cause why these two should not be married, if there is an impediment, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. So, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Let me not say that there are any things that can stop a marriage of true minds. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Okay. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds. A, B. We're going to put a C over there. Love isn't real love if it changes when it finds a change in the beloved. So, if A loves B and B changes, so A loves B and B changes from having love A to loving C, then what if the love is not love which Alters when an alteration finds me. What does A say when B turns from loving A to loving C? In this context, in, in what the speaker is saying, I love you still. Now, personal, real, living, emotional level, most people would say that's what? Effing crazy, right? That'd be like, you know, my wife and I have been married almost 37 years. You know, if one of us altered and the other one said, oh yeah, well, F you, you know, that would mean, according to the speaker, that's not real love. You know, mind blowing when you think about it, right? Love is not love, which alters when an alteration finds, or bends with the remover, this is B, the remover to remove. Bends. What does bend mean? Go out of true. Either leaning forward or leaning away from. Okay? True means it stays exactly the way it was. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark. Ever fixed. It doesn't change. Period. That looks on tempests and is never shaken. Okay, ever fixed mark, it's an astronomical kind of term. It is way up there. It looks down on the storms of life and notice it's not shaken by it. It is the star. It's the North Star, Polaris, to every wandering bark. Bark meaning little boat or ship. Why wandering? Because, hey, here's a port, and here's a port, and we can go all the way through the alphabet. And here's a port, and there's a port, and there's a port. Right? Okay. 
whose words unknown. What is the whose refers to? Loves. Loves worth is unknown, although his height, you can take a sextant and you can figure out the azimuth, the degree of elevation, be known. That is, you can do that, but that doesn't tell you what. Let's stop right there. What love is. Right? The wife of Beth says the question, you know, that the night has to answer is. What do women want? Okay. What's the real question? What is love? Okay, we'll stop there. We'll pick up with the rest of this sonnet. We'll do the rest of the sonnets that we're going to do on Monday. I haven't put the quiz up or the exam up in case you've been looking. I was homesick again yesterday. Um, I'll get it up the very latest tomorrow. It won't be due until Wednesday. Okay. I'll give you plenty of time. Have a good weekend.